All right. Welcome, everyone, to my session, Why Kotlin is the Better Java and How You Can Start Using It. Um, we had a little difficulty before, so um, I'm glad I actually have a presentation now, so everything works. Um, otherwise, we would have had to figure out how to do a presentation and coding without a screen. I'm glad I don't have to. So my name is Iris. I work for NetLight in Switzerland. Um, and yeah, welcome to the session. So I work as a tech consultant. And the blessing and curse as a tech consultant is that you get to work on different tech stacks. Um, so I don't always have a choice what exactly I'm working on. But if I do get a choice, I definitely try to well push my client towards um, more Kotlin. And today, I kind of want to share my enthusiasm for the language a bit. Um, we'll go through some, some like examples. Well, we'll start with a high-level comparison of Kotlin and Java. Then we will dive into some like uh, coding examples. And in the end, I will also show you how you can get started with Kotlin, because I assume by the end, you're all hooked and all convinced that this is a, the next thing you want to do. And in between, I will like throw in some examples, some stories from um, working um, on like a bigger project of about three years in production with Kotlin. So, what is the current state? So, I like got this overview of like the most used programming languages from like last year, and as we can see, like a third of developers say that they know Java. Um, less than 10% say they know Kotlin, and my goal is to like pump up these numbers a bit. Um, yeah, and it's fantastic that you're here for this. So if we compare Java and Kotlin, well, what do they have in common? Both are obviously high-level cross-platform um, general purpose programming languages. And well, Java, its first release was in 1996. So that's quite a while ago. Um, for those that, well, actually remember, I personally don't. Um, Java was designed with the like C, C++ syntax in, um, in, in mind, while Kotlin um, was actually de designed with the intention to be a better language than Java, which, I mean, sounds fantastic to me. Um, both offer object-oriented programming. Kotlin additionally also has like really good support for functional programming. Um, Kotlin is developed by JetBrains. These are the people behind IntelliJ. So that automatically means that tooling support is obviously fantastic because it like comes from the same uh, same crowd. And Kotlin was released 20 years after Java in uh, 2016. And I mean, let's let's put those two dates a bit into perspective. So 1996, um, Bill Clinton was president of the United States. Independence Day uh, was the highest grossing movie of the year, and the Tamagotchi had just been released. Um, 20 years later, we have Finding Dory as highest grossing movie, um, a, a sequel, I think, to, to Finding Nemo, a very, very popular movie. Uh, Barack Obama was president of the United States. And who remembers the one down here? Yeah, what, what is it? Yes, this is 2016 was the year when everyone was like walking around with the phone in front of their face and um, trying to find those gyms and get the level ups for the Pokemons. Okay, so what does Kotlin have? that Java does not. And this is just an overview. Um, I could probably go on with this list for quite a while. And I won't go into details right now, because the details will follow in just a few minutes. But I think the biggest thing that I already want to mention right here and now, null safety. That, I mean, if, if you're not sold on this one, like the promise of no null pointer exceptions, then I'm not sure what you're doing in this session. Um, one of my favorite function, uh, functionalities, extension functions, we'll also look at this. Uh, string templates, data classes, uh, we will look at. And what I've also mentioned before, the like support for functional programming. 
So let's dive in. Null pointer exceptions. Um, who of you develops or developed in Java? Yeah, who knows null pointer exceptions? I hope it's the same number of hands, because how could it not be? Or more hands, maybe. So null pointer exceptions, or well, the concept of null um, was called Java's billion dollar mistakes. And uh, yeah, they're not so fun. So what, what does Kotlin do? Um, Kotlin has this fantastic concept of null safety. So whenever you define a property, a variable, you define, is this property nullable, yes or no? And the compiler will check for you, um, well, if, if the things you try to do with that property, if they're actually like, could cause a null pointer exception. And we can see here, let me move, oops, go over there. So we have like those safe calls. Um, we have Lisa here defined as a nullable property. And if I want to like check the name of Lisa, I like use this null safe call. And I can also chain those null safe calls um, to make sure if any of like those elements is null, the whole expression just results in null. I do not have an exception. And then what I can also do, I can define a feedback, a fallback value with the Elvis operator. So if the whole expression is null, I can define like which value I want to use instead. Uh, question, why is it called the Elvis operator? My favorite question. Does anybody know? Yeah, I, I see some, some hand movements. Um, so if you put your head to the side, always have to be careful to the left side and use a lot of imagination this operator looks a little bit like, well, Elvis, the king of rock and roll. Still don't see it? Let me help you a bit. Ta-da! I, uh, I hope it's visible now. Um, yeah, small fun fact, I enjoy this. Um, all right, that is time for our first demo. Let's see if this works now. Okay. Is it readable? Is it? Let me let me make this a little bit bigger. Okay. Is it okay? Readable? Good. So I have here two uh, variables. I call one of them is a nullable string. I have like this question mark showing that this is nullable. I have a non-nullable string. Well, that doesn't have a question mark. Now let's see what we can do with this. And I mean, I just. I want to actually show you what you can see in the ID when developing, because slides really just don't teach you how to program. So what do we do? We have our nullable string. And I mean, I want to assign null. I, I assume that works, because it's a nullable string. Everything fine. If I assign any value, and I cannot type and talk at the same time, if I assign any value, that is also perfectly fine. All good here. I can also print this now. Or let's say we want to print the property of this. We want to print length. All good. Compiler is happy. If I now try to do the same with my non-nullable string, um, let's try to assign null. And here, without like having to, to test this at runtime, already at compile time here, also in the ID, I can see, um, well, null, uh, non nullable string cannot be null. So I get a compile time error here. And I mean, the earlier you get those errors, the better, because they're so much easier to fix. So I cannot do this. Let's see if we assign some other value. I mean, that, of course, is fine now, because it's not null. And if we now try to print the length, now it's actually mean because it already knows I have some value here. Uh, no, that, that is actually, yeah. Here it's fine. Here I actually have, let me switch this order around. Oops. And make it non-nullable here. And um, because before, that's a smart cast, we will get to this afterwards. Um, here we can see this is null, so I actually need to make a null safe call here. And I can use the Elvis operator to basically say, 
whatever value I want to use instead. All right, that's it for uh, our non safety demo. Let's move on to the next topic. Next topic is data classes. Um, who has been in the session before, just in this room? Because we, yes, then you've already seen a tiny bit of data classes. Um, the example we have here is Java. It's a class that has like two attributes, like simple plain old Java object. It has 50 lines. Um, yeah, Kotlin doesn't like this. So in Kotlin, nope, that didn't work. Let me try again. In Kotlin, we have data classes. And the whole thing we've seen before is this tiny piece of code we see over there. Um, with the small data keyword, Kotlin generates getters and setters if it's mutable. Uh, it generates hash code equals two string methods and some more that I actually won't go into. Um, yeah, and the class is still like nice and cute and tiny. A uh, small disclaimer here, like Java is catching up with uh, some of the cool Kotlin features, which I think is great. Um, released in stable since Java 16, um, Java has the concept of records, which provides a very similar functionality, but exclusively for immutable classes. So we're not quite here yet, but getting in this direction. What comes next? Let's look at the next demo. Okay, let me open my demo. Um, let me read again what I was planning to do here. Okay, so we want to create a class called course with the title and credits and whether it's graded or not. So I have here some uh, classes already. Here I have my university package and I'm creating a new, whoop. now it works, a new Kotlin class. Um, I want to make this a data class and then I need a constructor. And let me check again, what was our goal? Title, credit, and whether it's graded. So let's say we have our title, which is a string maybe. Um, and now because I'm using val, this means this is a non-mutable property. So I will actually only, Kotlin will only generate me a getter and not a setter. If I use var, the keyword, for maybe for the credit, which let's say is an int, and here maybe we already know like most courses get six credits, so we can actually define this as default value. And then we have the example of we want to know if it's graded, and this is a Boolean, and here as well we can define maybe a default value if we want. Um, great, first part done. And now we actually want to use this and see what we can do with this. Um, so let's say we have math. Who, who liked math in school? Who still likes math? Nice. Um, I, for me, I just kind of survived math. So it, yeah, not, not my favorite, but uh, it was useful, I guess. Um, so let's, I have to import this, of course. Maybe mathematics three, if we're very ambitious. Um, and what I can now immediately see here, if I know like math, um, I have to provide the title because here we don't have a default argument. For credits and graded, I actually have a default argument, so I don't need to provide this. And if I now want to say math is like really important, um, so maybe it gives you eight credits, I can change this. Um, if I want to say, oops, I want to say that change the title. Um, here again, now I get a um, compile time error because, as we've seen here, this is a non mutable field, so I don't have a setter. Um, so this won't work. If we try to do an other um, example, maybe some kind of communications course. 
Um, and here maybe we already know from the beginning it's also very important, so it gets eight credits. Or no, let's let's leave it at the, at the default six. Um, but maybe it's not graded. Maybe it's just like you have to pass, but you don't ac actually get a grade. Then I can use here um, named parameters. And without having to provide the, the credits, which is like could be part of the constructor, I can just say, OK, this is not graded. All right, and let me check my notes. Yes, that is what I wanted to show for data classes. Next topic, this one I really like. Um, extension functions are like one of my uh, favorite features of Kotlin, I think. Um, extension functions are really, really useful when you're working um, with some library that maybe you don't have the source code, you're just using it as a library and you're really missing some features, some function. What would you typically do in Java? You write a util class. How many of you have written a util class or util method only to realize, oh, somebody else has done this before? I, I definitely have. Um, how many of you have like been searching for util methods only to like realize apparently doesn't exist, or maybe I'm looking in the wrong place. I, I've definitely done this. And with Kotlin, all of this is gone. Um, because you can write an extension method, and like uh, these this extension functions, and they behave like regular functions of this class. So here we have the example um, of on mutable list, we add a swap function. And if I'm using an object of mutable list. I get this as a like suggestion code completion. So I find the function, and this is actually a, I think, yeah, in my opinion, one of one of the best features of, of Kotlin. And as you probably imagined, we do a demo for this. Um, let me move to the extension function demo. So um, I've already um, prepared like a tiny bit of code here. So we have an employee class with my name. Um, so we have the name of the employee. We have here the profession. Uh, we have my, my employer, which as I mentioned is NetLite. And let's go back here. We now assume that, yes, this employee class, it, it's over here. Um, but let's assume this is like part of a um, library where we can't just add a function to it. So what do we do now? We can write an extension function. So I define, I write an extension function on employee, and I want to say uh, works. So it works for an awesome company. Um, we want to get a boolean. Um, and yeah, I'm just really doing some very simple example here. So now I can check. Um, with this, I have access to like the um, public properties. I do not get access to, to private properties because, well, we simply do not see them. Um, and let's just say my employer is a, is a cool company, um, so I can just check for this. And now if I work with this employee class, I get here my extension function, as I mentioned, in code completion. And I can just simply use this here. I never touched the employee class. And I still now have here a function that behaves as if it is on the employee class. Um, let's actually just quickly print this and see if it works. I think first time is the tests are always a bit slow, but um, let's give them a second. Now we can see, yeah, we, we print true. So we um, call this function down here. Um, extension functions, you can make them um, like, you can make them public. You can also make private extension functions if you have like something that is like very, very specific for a class you're working on and you don't want to 
basically pollute everyone's uh, code completion, um, then you could also define a, a private extension function. All right, that's it for extension functions. Let's move on to the next topic, uh, string templates. So dealing with strings in Java um, or like string concatenation is, in my opinion, like surprisingly complicated. Um, I have the first option, I can like do concatenation with the plus operator, um, which, well, it gets a bit hard to read. Um, there also used to be concerns about like, uh, basically for, from a performance perspective, that we like keep correct, uh, creating new strings. I think this has been solved for a while, but at least in my opinion, it's still not fantastic to read. Um, then the second option, string builder. It might, it's a very nice class. It like well uses the builder pattern, um, but it's just very verbose. I mean, why would I want to write like what is it seven eight lines of of code um, for something so simple? We also have like string format, which I think is quite nice and has actually like the advantage for like each variable put in there. Um, I can define how it's supposed to be formatted exactly in the string. But what I really do not like about it is that the place um, where the variable goes in the string um, is very separated from the variable. So it's, it's fairly easy to like do some switch up over here without realizing, because it, it's not very connected to where this variable goes in the string. So what does Kotlin have? Um, well, I already named it. We have it string, uh, they have string templates. And Within um, a string with like the dollar sign we see here, you can directly add variables. Um, if you use the curly brackets, you can put in whole expressions and it gets parsed like this. Um, yeah, and I think it's a very small thing, uh, but something I really appreciated when switching from uh, Java to Kotlin. And yeah, I mean, this is not a, like a purely Kotlin idea, of course, this is something that like quite a lot of um, newer languages have. And as I wrote down here, I just checked this a few weeks ago. Um, Java is actually also implementing string templates. It should be available later this year. So again, it's kind of nice that they uh, take up some of the cool ideas that Kotlin already has. You might think, demo time, right? But in this case, actually, no, that, that's already all I wanted to show you um, about string templates. So no, no actual demo here. I, I hope that's fine. Um, next topic, smart casts. I've mentioned this before already, or like hinted at it a little bit. Um, when we check, when we do a check of like, what kind of class is the object I have right now? I mean, in, in Java, you would do an instance of, and then after the instance of, you still have to do like a cast to the class that you now want to be working on. And again, it's something fairly small, um, but that I really enjoy in Kotlin. It's that if you like do such a check, Kotlin automatically knows, ah, you check this is a string and you can immediately like use the object as a string. And here it is actually demo time, so let's go to the next demo. Um, here. Okay, um, I have here prepared a little method um, that gets an object of type any. Um, well, any is to make it simple, very similar to object in, in Java. Basically, everything you have is any. Um, and as we can see here, I put in this print value method, I can throw in a string. Down here, we see I can throw in like an employee, the class we've seen before. Um, and now here, if I like want to, let's say, x dot length, um, of that I would have on a string because I want to print its length. I, I don't have this available because, well, it's any, any doesn't have a dot length property. But if I do if x is string, um, now I can 
again, we see them at automatically in like code completion. Um, this property is now available, and I can treat x directly as a string, um, since I have now checked it is a string. And of course, the same works if I do if I check if it's an employee. Oops. Um, And now I can immediately, um, uh, let's maybe make, let's throw in a small string template example. I put in like the name works for employer. And now we can run this and this part will probably not look very nice because if I um, put like a class in here, it will basically just call two strings. So let's quickly have a look at how this looks. Yeah, um, so I get a two string on this class now that does not look as fantastic as I would like it to look. Let's quickly change this and just print the name of the employer. All right, now we have like four, well, it's just a little lonely four here. Um, but that is like the length of this test string we put in. And here we have um, the text on employee. And yeah, there is no casting. And actually, I'm not sure if you can, how well you can see it. Um, you can see the X here. It has like a tiny greenish background. Um, that is what, and yeah, with the mouse on it, you can already, it also tells you there is a smart cast happening here. So the ID actually tells you what it is doing. So that, that's also kind of a nice feature, I think. All right. Um, the next topic is kind of difficult to, you know, really demonstrate. Um, but I want to share a bit of a story about readability. Um, in my opinion, Kotlin is a lot more readable than Java. One of the reasons is you just write less code. I mean, with many of the examples that we've now looked at, Kotlin avoids a lot of boilerplate code you would have in Java. And if there is less code to read, uh, less code to write, there is less code to read, and that often makes it easier. I mean, of course you can go crazy with this and like minimize it and like not use nice names and everything. Yes, but if you avoid overhead and boilerplate, I think code gets more readable. And then also the support for like functional programming um, combined with the extension functions. So if you require some kind of function that doesn't exist on the class you're working on, you can just write it and you can like make very nice chains. Um, and in the end, it reads very nicely, um, like the combination of like, okay, I do this step first and then the next one. Um, yeah. And as I mentioned in the beginning, like I've been working for about three years on a um, project in Kotlin with like a group of developers. We all had known Java before. None of us had Kotlin experience. So it was a bit of an adventure in the beginning. Um, and it took us a moment also to write Kotlin code in the Kotlin way. So yeah, it was a bit of getting into, of course. Um, but when we had new joiners, again, with like zero Kotlin experience before, each and every one of them mentioned how easy it was to get into the project, how easy it was to read the code, to understand. And I mean, yes, maybe we just write really beautiful code, um, but we all know everyone has a bad day every once in a while. So I really think it, that was not just on us. And a lot of this is really on the language. And I mean, also, Today, I mean, I don't know how many of you, how many of you have, have written Kotlin for production before? Okay, a few. And how many of you like had troubles understanding my coding examples? I see no hands. So, and I didn't really explain the language a lot. Um, so I think also if you don't have the specific experience with the language, if you get some general programming concepts, it's fairly easy and quick to get into. All right. 
at this point, you might be wondering, am I maybe being a little bit unfair to Java here? And I started this presentation <laughs> with, um, well, that I wanted to share my enthusiasm. So yes, um, you probably know my answer already, but well, let's look at it anyways. Um, so let's look at what does Java have that Kotlin does not. Well, we have checked exceptions. Um, who of you likes those? <laughs> yeah, I see no one. No, one person, okay. I mean, I think checked exceptions, um, the idea was to basically force engineers, um, well, to deal with the problems they might be causing. Um, I think there is some value to that, but in practice, in my opinion, it often bloats your code. Um, you have to add, like the throws declaration, you have to do, um, like, try catch at places where you probably don't want to do this. And with Kotlin, you don't have checked exceptions, all of them are unchecked. So you actually, you're more free in deciding where to actually want to deal with exceptions. Um, next thing that like Java has that Kotlin does not um, is primitive types. So in Java, we have like the situation, we have some primitives, um, then there's like the equivalent class, there's like the whole unboxing and, and out-of-boxing stuff. Um, in Kotlin, that doesn't exist. So everything is a class. Um, you don't have to deal with primitives that then can't be null and have default values. Also in the session before, you've, we've like seen some examples of this. Um, and one thing that I was glad to get rid of, I have to admit, I have always quite struggled with the, the wildcard types in, in Java. Yes, I'm sure people can get into this. I don't find them very intuitive. And I found the generic types in, in Kotlin, um, well, a, a lot more understandable and easier to learn. So are there still reasons to use Java over Kotlin? I mean, again, I'm very biased. So um, I mean, if you just want to learn a new language, maybe. Um, maybe you're just like, no, I just stick with what I know, perfectly fine. Um, or another thing, Maybe your lines of codes are, I don't know, relevant for your salary. I have heard those stories. Um, I have gladly never been in the situation. Um, I'm not sure if they really exist, but if that's your case, then do not switch to Kotlin, because again, as I mentioned, you will write less code. So that would be bad for your salary. And I'm fully aware I'm now here complaining about the very popular and, and like, rightly so, very big language. So, I mean, there is this famous quote, there are only two kinds of programming languages, those people complain about and those nobody uses. Um, so yeah, I mean, especially like portability has made Java big and it has definitely um, its reasons. And nevertheless, I kinda want to remind you that this quote comes from the inventor of C++ a language that is definitely widely used, but also definitely widely and loudly complained about, um, just for some context. All right, I hope that at this point, I have convinced you that, I mean, even if you love Java, Kotlin is worth a try. Um, and I really hope that, uh, yeah, you're all wondering now, okay, what, what do I need to do? How do I get started? So let's look at this a tiny bit. First of all, Java and Kotlin um, are interoperable. So Kotlin is designed to be interoperable with Java. You can call Java code from, from Kotlin and the other way around. What you cannot do is mix like Java and Kotlin code in the same source file. What you can do is mix them in the same project. Um, so there are like some considerations, um, basically, all the things where Kotlin is like, let's say, significantly different than Java, um, like the, the getter setter, um, get represented as properties in Kotlin, if the naming fits. So if you like have some naming that doesn't like go the like standard get set property name, um, yeah, that that doesn't really work that nicely. 
also we have like the topic with like some types are mapped, like primitives and arrays um, that just don't exist in this way in Kotlin. Um, there are also some limitations. And for me, kind of the biggest limitation and one thing that I find a little sad um, is when you mix Java and Kotlin, you actually lose quite a lot of like the null safety that I so love in Kotlin. Um, because when we get like values from, from Java into Kotlin, we don't know if it's like, is it a nullable value? Is it a non-nullable value? Um, there are some annotations you can use to help with this, but this is definitely something um, to keep in mind as a limitation. But nevertheless, um, you don't have to start a greenfield project like from the ground up in Kotlin. You do have the option to step-by-step -step migrate an existing Java project to start writing new modules, new functionality in Kotlin, and they will work together. And then, of course, maybe step-for-step -step migrate the rest. Who knows? Um, how do you learn Kotlin? Basically, number one that I want to point out, if now you feel like, oh, that sounds nice, and I just kind of want to try this a bit, um, are the Kotlin counts. Um, they are like a series of exercises used to get into like the Kotlin style of programming, um, primarily aimed at Java developers, but I think you don't actually have to know like any in-depth Java stuff to, to appreciate them. And it's also how I started, so I, I can highly recommend them. I mean, you don't know everything afterwards, but it really like gives you some, some good overview. Um, you can read a book. Personally, I read the um, I always have to think, Kotlin in action. Um, but Atomic Kotlin is also like well-loved, highly rated. Um, both of them should give you a good overview, especially after you kind of started your journey in Kotlin. If you feel like, oh, okay, now I want to get some more, more details, um, then this is a good option. But of course, we all know you don't learn coding um, with a book. Um, you learn coding by actually building things. Um, and there are many things you can build with Kotlin. Um, I mean, let me start with the middle one, Android app. Th since, let me check, 2019, I think, um, is Kotlin like the official preferred language for Android? Um, so if you build an Android app, Kotlin is definitely the way to go. But you can also work on like backend applications. Um, you can, as we've also seen in the session before, uh, combine it with Spring Boot. And there are some like really nice libraries you can use together with Kotlin. Um, yeah, and then number three, I actually have no experience. I still want to mention it. Um, Kotlin has the option um, to actually also do like um, native work. So you can actually, if you're, I don't know, on, on an embedded environment um, where you don't want to or cannot work with, with some containers, um, you can also use Kotlin for, for such use cases. All right. So at this point, I mean, you kind of have the option, where do I want to go? Um, I mean, I started this like, why, why Kotlin is the better Java. And when I mentioned this session title um, to my mentor at NetLight for the first time, her reaction was like, really, do you want to start a war? And that's not my goal. That's not what I'm here for. Um, I just really wanted to share my enthusiasm for a language that I really enjoyed learning, that I very much enjoyed working with. Um, and the nice thing is when you like switch from Java to Kotlin, you're still in, let's say, the same, the same universe. Um, it works on the JVM, um, so all the libraries, all the tools you're used to, you can still use them. They're still available. So there's really like a lot of interconnection, um, but your code is nicer to write, uh, more fun to write, safer to use. So um, yeah, uh, I really suggest, if you haven't tried it before, give it a go in this project or the next project, maybe. 
all right, that's everything from my side. As I said, my name is Iris. Um, you can find me on those platforms. And the examples we looked at today, you can also find them on my GitHub if you'd like. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I think we still have a moment for uh, questions, if anybody has one. Yes, please. Hello. Uh, can you use extension functions to override existing functions? Uh, good question. Um, I'd have to check. I think not. Mm -hmm. I think you get into a naming conflict, but I am honestly not sure. I, I'd have to look that up. Because I have another question. How do you manage that since you can basically change any class from every, anywhere in your code base, how do you mitigate the risk that you might have changes everywhere? Um, okay, I mean, for this, this is kind of like what I also mentioned, you can make extension functions private. So if you have like, um, maybe you're in some calculator class and you're really interested in some weird number like stuff on a, on a class and write extension functions for this, you can make this extension function private, so you only use it like within the class um, that you have defined. And this is something that I think helps quite a lot to to not yeah pollute kind of um, the the codes in in your entire code base. That, does this answer the question? Cool. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, so you say that we cannot mix uh, Kotlin with Java in the same source file? Sorry? Uh, you, you say that we, you cannot mix Java and Kotlin in the same source file? No, they're so actually, yeah. yeah. Let's say I want to, I, I, I have an, a library in Java, and I want to use, uh, use it in my Kotlin project. So, uh, so d does that mean that I have to create two uh, separate files? One for Kotlin and one for Java? When you're... Are you using the li library or are you writing li the li library? Library. You're I'm using it. Yeah. Um, I mean, whether the library is in Java or in Kotlin, that doesn't matter. You can use it um, in Kotlin, yeah, either way. Or do I misunderstand the question, maybe? Yeah, but, but how? That's my question. Uh, you just like call the functions, same as before. It doesn't matter um, what language it was written in. You have like some function that you're using, yeah. You call this function from you, your you copy can, code. You can still import the library and yes, call the function, yes. but you, you cannot write uh, Java code. You cannot write Kotlin and Java code in the same file, but you can call like Java um, methods from Kotlin. That you can, no problem at all. Okay. Uh, so another question is there backward backward compatibility with the older versions of Java? Uh, how does uh, Kotlin handle this? Um, I think when was the split? Um, so, I don't remember at which point it was. Um, there is like a specific version, basically, um, where where this was originally split, and that also means that like some small things are sometimes not available in Kotlin. Um, but in general, like you have, you define your your Kotlin version, um, and with this one, I think it should be um, mapped to like what you can use in Java. Um, does that answer the question? Like the Kotlin version basically tells you how the compatibility with, with Java uh, works. Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, it's in regards to null uh, safety. Um, mm -hmm. When you have uh, multiple arguments, uh, null safe checked, uh, uh, can you know which one returns null wh when you have uh, your whole uh, segment that returns null? Uh, you mean, let me, that, ooh, that was right at the beginning. Um, boop, boop, boop. Data. You mean in this example, yes. whether you know if like, let's say Lisa department or description is null? Yes. No, you, just the whole expression. Um, returns null, evaluates to null. You don't actually know which one um, was the, let's say, cause of the null. Okay, so if you want to know, you have to check specifically each one. Yes. Uh, which one yes. If, if you really want to know very specifically where, like basically, uh, the null gets, gets introduced, then you still have to check.
so my question would be, um, uh, so uh, indeed we haven't seen uh, an example, a demo uh, of this interoperability. Mm -hmm. Uh, and especially, for instance, we have seen uh, that it is used uh, sometimes uh, in Spring Boot and everything. But sometimes, uh, I mean, Spring Boot uh, uses heavily the annotations, so the aspect-oriented programming. Uh, do we have, for instance, this in uh, in Kotlin? And the second, uh, and I mean, for instance, the the data, the data st uh, stuff was. Uh, handled by some libraries with these annotations, for, in, for instance. So, so it's really a, a very generic way of uh, uh, handling a, a lot of things. Uh, so it, does, does it still exist? Uh, is there an alternative in Kotlin? And uh, yeah, let's... Okay, let, let me see if I understood you correctly. Um, you're asking about, like, you mentioned a data class. Um, uh, f f uh, simple, uh, simple first, uh, d does aspect-oriented programming exist? So uh, an annotation uh, that says, uh, hey, this method is a uh, get mapping, so it's going to be something that is an API REST uh, stuff. Um, I think I haven't used this myself, but I would assume so. Um, but I, I'm not, I think I haven't used it myself. Okay, and, and so uh, the the, th the second question I had was, uh, so we have uh, the, the the it's really like still two different languages. So yes. uh, it, it's not like the compiler can uh, handle either one uh, of those two classes. I mean, so, so so when we have a project, for instance, that has some Java code and some uh, Kotlin code, we mm -hmm. have. Uh, like a Maven file that will uh, define two compiler methods for both uh, things. Yeah, I mean, in the end, both um, compile to like the same bytecode. It's still both run on the JVM, um, and you can like define this in your in your uh, Maven or or Gradle file um, to basically like yeah compile the, the Java and Kotlin parts of your um, of your project. Yeah, but but it's two different compilers, not one. Um, ju just to, just to yeah. make sure. Um, yes. I, yeah, they're yeah they're. I mean, in the end, it's the same, but yes, it's like it's two separate uh, uh, compilations, basically. Compile time is probably is is about comparable. Um, it, there's not really a big difference. Also, like regarding performance on memory in general between a uh, Kotlin or Java. Yes, one maybe one last question. I think uh, when you mix both Java and Kotlin, uh, you get the breakpoint in IntelliJ normally. I mean, yes, is it easy to problem. debug? Yes. Yes. Cool. Um, I'm still around. If you have more questions, just approach me or like contact me on any of the platforms I've shown. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>